Tara Kemp, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you, Howie. Good to be here. Yeah, I've got to say, you're, you're one of the guests that I do the least preparation for because I just know we're just going to have a great conversation. <laughs> I don't know if I should be admitting that, but you know, you haven't said No, many- that's, that's awesome. I love podcasts. It's my favorite type of media to consume and to be part of, even though I don't have my own podcast. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm sure it'll be a stimulating, wonderful conversation. Well, for, the, for those people who are just listening and not watching on YouTube, you are rocking the headphones. Oh, thank you. I'm trying to have the good, high quality, you know, sound for you. I, I appreciate that. And, and there's no <laughs> there's no mic in your face. That's, that's the thing I always have to worry about is right, uh, right. Mo- moving this thing so it doesn't cover up. <laughs> so um, we talked years ago at this mm-hmm. point. Um, why don't you give us a uh, you know one minute uh, slow elevator speech about who you know who you are just to to orient people to what we're going to be talking about? Oh yeah, sure, of course. So I am a mental health coach and researcher. Um, I run a number of different programs that particularly work with women, helping them to overcome struggles with food and body to build a healthier relationship with themselves and find that place of peace. And a lot of that has come from being in this world um, that you and I are both in of plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine, um, whole food, plant-based eating, where, you know, so many people come in with this positive intention of wanting to eat healthy, wanting to do better for themselves. But we live in a society full of diet culture. We are, you know, humans, meaning that we're going to be imperfect. And we also live in a, um, in a space where, mental health often isn't talked about or addressed to the extent that it needs to. And so I've created these programs to help you have a healthy relationship with food and healthy relationship with your body by starting with that inner work to get to that, you know, core relationship with yourself first. And so that's the work that I do in terms of coaching. Um, I'm also, like I said, a researcher, I'm getting my PhD at Northern Arizona University. I realize this is more than a minute, but (laughs) um, I'll wrap it up shortly here. Um, So as part of my research for that, I'm uh, looking at the intersection of vegan diets and eating disorders um, and how that applies to the space of recovery when someone is looking to be in recovery. Um, Can they eat a vegan diet? How does that play into that process for them. Um, And also as part of my research, I'm working with Adam Sud on a study where we're looking at whole food plant-based diets in recovery from substance abuse and how that affects that process, both on the physical and mental health level. So that's a little bit about me and and what I'm up to and all about. Gotcha. That's uh, that's great to bring me up to speed because I've I've been following you mostly on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And you're you're one of the the only people I actually like click to the comments. Like I'm, I'm not much mm. of an Instagram, but it's like scroll through people's pictures, but you, you always seem to find time to, uh, to look at, to look at a picture that you're about to post and like go deep to like what, what this says to you and what you want to say to other people. And it, uh, I don't know if you make any money off of that, but it's an awful lot. Oh, I I don't make any money just from being on Instagram at all or from sharing information there. That's just, you know, for for love and service. Um, But yeah, I kind of only have one mode, which is deep. (laughs) I don't really do service level. I kind of, that's my life. It's, it's, um, I'm learning moderation, but I'm a lot of all or nothing. And I'm either in for the depth and connection or or not. Um, so yeah, Instagram is one of those spaces where, yeah, if I'm going to show up and write a post, I'm going to make sure that it's hopefully, you know, worth people's time and coming from the heart. Mm. So what, what's like one important thing, if, like if you could, you know, have the world's media on you for like a minute, I'll give you another minute. <laughs> <laughs> like that you want people to know about eating and health and mental health and happiness. Like what's, you know, is there, yeah. is there kind of a core thing that you just kind of want to shout and shake everybody till they get? Yes, I feel like I have a lot of those things, but I will try to pick a single one. I'm pretty bad at picking favorites, but uh, you um, know what? You get you feel totally free to ignore <laughs> any of my constraints okay. restrictions. Two, two came to mind. Two came to mind. So I'll say those two, and I'll make them brief. Um, the first one is that a I think perpetuated idea 
within relationship with food or relationship with body is that someone thinks that's what it's about. That if they're struggling in their relationship with food, if they feel stressed out about food or they feel like they just can't figure out how to eat in a way that's going to make them feel at peace or free in their life or confident about themselves and same thing about their bodies. They can't figure out how to get their body to be where they want it to be. They think that the solution is going to be in changing the food or changing their body. Oh, I just need this different fitness program. Oh, I just need to try intermittent fasting, or I need to try the McDougal starch approach, or I need to add more fats like Furman says, or, you know, I, I need to use this, you know, eating window or this, it, it, we think that we need to change the food and, and the body is really what it comes down to. And that's really not the case. Um, that is kind of like the rest of the, the lifestyle medicine space that's focusing on the symptoms that's focusing on, you know, what is happening as an effect of the deeper level cause. And so, yes, what you experience um, on the surface is that internal struggle of feeling stressed about your food choices or feeling unhappy with your body and where you're at um, and feeling just, yeah, out of sorts with all of that. But that's not really where the healing lies. Yes, there are certain things that you need to address there if someone's chronically overeating or binge eating or restricting or they've lost a ton of weight um, or they need to restore a healthy weight in some way. Yes, those things at some level do need to be addressed, especially if they're affecting one's health in the immediate um, you know, reality in the, in the current situation. But that's not what, that is not what's going to create a long-term healing process where it doesn't come back the next time that life, you know, gets crazy and shit hits the fan because those things are coping mechanisms for, you know, this underlying experience of having some sort of discomfort that you don't have the tools and recess resources to use in order to support yourself in that process. So if someone is feeling, um, it's, it's basically, it's, it's a coping mechanism to boil that down. So I'll, I'll keep brevity on that and I'll, I'll start with that one. And then the other thing that I'll say is related to that, which is just that, um, you know, in the space of food, mental health, all of it, it's all kind of one in the same, you know, to separate out eating disorders from obsessive compulsive disorder, from anxiety, from depression, from, um, you know, addictive disorders, many of them, it's all kind of the same root cause in the same way that, you know, metabolic disorder um, can lead to type two diabetes or heart disease, or, you know, these other chronic con conditions, just based on the way that your body decides to deal with that underlying experience it's the same. And so for one person, they might be experiencing anxiety for another person. It might look like obsessive compulsive disorder. And for another person, it might look like an eating disorder. And really it's all kind of the same root things where you're feeling, you know, it at the core, it's really disconnection. You're disconnected from yourself. You're disconnected from your values, from a sense of purpose and meaning from feeling um, your place in the bigger picture of the world from that spiritual perspective, feeling disconnected from uh, a social community where you feel seen and feel a sense of belonging. And so it's those kind of things that at the root really lead to this experience where we're trying to cope in one way or another in our brain, which is this beautiful organ that has so much to offer us, but also uh, can be our, to our detriment and downfall when it starts to run wild and we're not getting to those deeper things. Mm. So let me, let me um, offer what, something, what I hear sometimes as a challenge to the idea that it's not about the food. Mm -hmm. uh, right? um, I love this. Which, which is obesity has like skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's in the Western world in the last, you know, 50 years. And like, are we way more depressed, anxious, socially disconnected, spiritually disconnected? Or is it like the trans fats and the, you know, food marketing and like, you know, there's at some level of it, I want to say, well, it is the material objective stuff that you can see. Mm -hmm. Like what, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so this is a great place to talk about. Of course, there is truth to everything and it's all interconnected. So living in a world that's focused on fast food and where we're eating things that we have no idea what the ingredients are, what's in them, that is a form of disconnection. We are disconnected. And so what I would say to that is 
I'm more focused on, I'm not focusing on specifically like the physical ailments that one is experiencing in their body. It's more so their mental experience of, you know, their relationship to themselves and to their body and to food. So if someone has a poor relationship with their body because they, you know, based on a, you know, BMI chart says they are obese um, or overweight, as you said, um, and they personally feel, you know, too big in their body. And so they're feeling discomfort, they're feeling self-loathing, they're feeling, um, just, you know, constant stress and shame and guilt and, you know, just basically negative feelings about themselves. That is not going to be solved by them losing weight. Because ultimately at the core, it's feeling like your worth is tied to the size of your body. And so if you are to lose weight, Number one, the, the methodology and the means by which that happens is, is going to be important because it needs to be sustainable. Very many times people are doing it in a way that isn't going to be sustainable. Um, and so that leads to yo-yo dieting and just leads to perpetuated and increased shame um, of the self. But if you do lose weight and you suddenly are happy, or I shouldn't say suddenly, but in time you become happy with the way that your body looks, you've then kind of imprisoned yourself to say, I will only feel happy if I maintain this. So then there's still this feeling of pressure to maintain the weight loss and to maintain you know, where you're at. It kind of is this unending cycle. And so the key, and I'm not, I'm not saying like you can never lose weight or you can never you know, do a fitness program that makes you feel really good about yourself because you feel stronger and you know, um, more capable and things like that. But it's more so understanding that at the root, you have to first heal that relationship with the self that says that they're, that your worth is tied to the shape or fitness or size of your body. And it needs to come from this place of, you know, if you're making changes, it's come a place of number one, I love myself unconditionally. I care about myself. This is me being a caretaker to my body and to myself. And I'm sorry. There's a train in the background. I don't know if you can hear oh, that. I was, I was hearing it. It almost sounded like uh, like new age music in the back. <laughs> like, do, do you have, are you a superhero? Do you have like soundtrack? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a train that runs through town here where I live in Durango and I, was, I, was, I guess it's moving through. They like to tell everyone that they're happy, that it's happening. Um, it's quite distracting. I'm so sorry. But anyways, um, we can pause this and uh, edit. <laughs> no worries. Um, but yeah, I think that that's just a really huge piece to keep in mind. And so it's not that I'm saying that there's anything wrong with our culture around food. I think there's a lot with our culture around food. I mean, you know that I'm very much part of the you know world of lifestyle medicine and whole food plant-based nutrition and i believe in you know like small scale organic farming and you know all these amazing things and why i believe in that in part is being more connected to our food and connected to ourselves and understanding what feels best in your body so much of the weight loss world is not focused on what feels best in your body it's focused on how do i lose the weight and so we're using all of these tactics and things that actually pull us further away from ourselves rather than being rooted in our core values, in our core belief system, in our priorities, and, and really looking at what is a way of eating that is true to me, that my body wants as much as my brain wants, and that is going to be sustainable long-term because it brings me joy and makes me feel good and um, is true to myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So is, is um, I mean, I, I hear this from people who talk about intuitive eating, mm -hmm. um, which I inherently distrust because if I were to eat intuitively, you know, I would eat crap. Mm. Right? So I have a question for you about that. Have you read the book, Intuitive Eating? No. Okay. I recommend that you do. I didn't, I didn't know there was a the book. I just know hmm, there's a so, Right, right, right. Well, even if you just look up um, the term intuitive eating and, and go through, because I had a similar um, hesitancy to it years ago. And when you look into what intuitive eating comprises of, it's not just on a whim, what do I crave? It's 
you know, understanding that, but really being in that space of connection to honor internal and external wisdom and being in that space of a caretaker to your body. And I, I am using this from this phrase caretaker, because that's what most resonates with me. That's not a term that the intuitive eating um, movement uses, but they would say inner versus outer wisdom is I think what they say. And to me, that's understanding, okay, you know, if I am sitting down to dinner and I haven't had any vegetables yet that day, even if I'm not craving vegetables, using outer wisdom says that would be really nourishing for me. And mm -hmm. so intuitive eating isn't just saying, oh, I feel like another donut or, you know, oh, I feel like ice cream for dinner. It's okay. Like, you know, if I'm in the mood for sweets, you know, why is that happening, happening, tuning in, um, being in connection, you know, am, did I have a stressful day? Is sugar what I turn to when, you know, I need that stress relief or, Am I having trouble coping with certain emotions and I'm trying to distract myself or numb myself? Um, so it's intuitive eating, you know, intuition is connection with the self, connection with our body. Um, in my program, Reconnect Academy, I teach people how to connect with their body, kind of bypass the brain, drop into the body and be in that space of connection where your body literally feels a yes or no. For, for yourself in, in many situations. And the brain can turn it into this big cycle of, you know, what does this other person think? What, you know, quote, should I do? What would the right logical position be? Like our brain wants to overanalyze and create logic around everything, which again, the brain is a wonderful, you know, tool for us. And it can overshadow or it can cloud the intuitive knowledge that we have within our body and to be able to feel that yes or no. So basically intuitive eating is simply eating from a place of being connected to your body and to, um, you know, to, to that sense. And yes, that might mean honoring, you know, your, your desire for a sweet from time to time, but it also means knowing that your body thrives when it eats these fresh, you know, more nutrient dense foods and giving yourself that, um, as, as a, being a caretaker to your body. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm appreciating your, your both and approach to. Oh, totally. I'm all about the and I'm all about the gray space. <laughs> um, so what, I, I don't know if this is a silly question or may not make any sense, but you, you were talking earlier about like the, this idea of, you know, connection with yourself and, and finding things that are unconditional about yourself, hmm. whether you're not and I'm wondering, is there, um, is there a difference between like landing on a, an identity that you really love versus getting rid of identities? Mm. Okay, that... I love this. We're, get, we're getting a little like meta spiritual here, which I'm so into. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to take another both and because I think it's really important to know ourselves and I think it's also equally as important to note that that's an ever evolving process, that who we are today is not who we will be tomorrow. And that's not who we'll be in five years, certainly. And so having an identity and knowing ourselves like, yes, it is really important to know the circumstances of, you know, this season of life, you know, just before we started this call, I was telling you, okay, like in this season of my life, I've been working on creating more balance and, you know, stepping away from the overloaded plate that I always used to have. And that's because, you know, I have moved in with my partner and I'm trying to like shift into this new phase where like, I don't want to be the overachiever workaholic anymore. That was an amazing phase that served me really well and got me to this place where I have a fully running business and I'm almost finished with my PhD. And, you know, I've got all these wonderful things to, to show for what I've been doing over the past couple of years. And it's time for me to slow down. And so part of my identity is I can handle a lot of things at once. I can juggle a lot of things and thrive, but I don't want to play into, I don't want to feed that part of myself anymore. I want to shift into this part of me that can also be moving slower and have more balance and be spending more time with family and building community in this space where, like I said, I just moved to this new um, town six months ago, bought a house. Like I, I want to put in roots here. And so I'm shifting into this new phase of my identity. And so it's really important to understand the circumstances of your life, the, that season of your life and the values and priorities that are part of that. 
Um, something that I see very often in my work is a lot of people can state um, to an extent their values and their priorities. And some people haven't ever taken the time to truly think about what are my core values? You know, what do I want to build my life around um, as a value system? But other people have, but even those who have, very often, if you then ask a follow-up question that says, okay, if you were to outline how you spend your time each day, does that align with your values? And for a lot of people, the answer is no. They might say, oh, my top value is family, or oh, my top value is spending time in nature. Oh, my top value is, you know, X, Y, Z thing. And then it's like, oh, but they spend all day at the office and then they, you know, get home and they watch TV and then they roll into bed and, you know, maybe have a glass of wine or a beer to take the edge off and that's their day. And, and it's just so frequently that we're living in that space of disconnection and, and misalignment. And so it's really important to know yourself for that reason, to have that aspect of your identity. But it's also important to be perpetually checking in. How am I feeling today? You know, what, what is happening for me right now? Is there anything that is starting to feel like I don't want to keep you know, going down that path? Or is there anything that I want to shift or that I'm feeling change within me? And so it's an ever evolving process. We are infinite beings who can live in multiple identities. Um, but, but having that self understanding is really important. Another thing I'll throw in there um, is it's helpful to know our tendencies. And this plays into this mental health piece as well. So um, for instance, I know that I have a tendency towards anxiety, that I have a tendency towards obsessive thinking. Um, I tend a lot more in that direction than toward, you know, depression or, or the, that kind of, that, that side of um, the spectrum or sphere of it, I guess I'd say. Um, that's not to say that I have never dealt with depression, but I know that I have those tendencies. And so it's important for me to take certain steps, to have certain lifestyle practices that help me in those ways. Um, I also uh, have been learning a lot more recently about the, uh, the character trait HSP, which stands for highly sensitive person, um, which I was told by a therapist years and years ago that I was and never really like fully looked into it. It wasn't the, the focus of our work at that time. And as I've learned more about it, I'm realizing more and more so much of my life <laughs> makes so much more sense understanding this piece of me. And so I've been able to build in new boundaries for myself and um, be more confident in taking care of myself in certain ways just by understanding this part of myself. And so I think that that piece is also important to have an understanding of, you know, the things in the same way that's helpful to know that heart disease runs in my family. You know, it's like, oh, okay, that's really good to know because it helps me understand what preventive steps to take to be the best caretaker to myself and to my body from a physical health standpoint. And so it's, it's just, it's the same thing with mental health. And um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it brings me to another one, which is when I hear you, know, my impression of you, and I don't know you very well, right? We've met a few times, <laughs> I follow you on Instagram. So there's clearly, there's all the sorts of pro, pro, uh, projection. Yeah, yeah. But my impression of you is that at least your, your, your curated public self is like relentlessly positive, upbeat, mm. loving, forgiving. And when I hear you talk about something like so many people don't live their values, mm -hmm. I immediately go to a political um you know, sort of mode of mm. like, you would never say that about an, an indigenous tribe, like all oh, the people in that tribe who are living, you know, who are living on the land, aren't living their values. And it right. me makes me pissed off that we are living in a world in which it's so damn hard to live our values. I was just uh, emailing with a, a friend of mine, a, a, a um, indigenous Australian mm -hmm. researcher who um, was, was, you know, he talks a lot about how, how colonization domesticates us. Mm. And I'm talking about like how domesticated I feel. Like I've just, I've had like a good year in terms of productivity and business. And I'm like, the, you know, the better I do, the less I give a shit about other people on the planet. It's like, mm. you know, I don't want to be that way, but I can feel it happening in my brain. Yeah. And it, it feels like to live my values like is a hell of a lot of work and constant practices. And I'm sometimes willing to do it, 
but like, you know, it gets to the point where helping people one-on-one -on -one just feels pointless. And I just want to, you know, get a pitchfork and a, a burning, you know, bale of hay and go storm something. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to be fully honest with you, uh, which I have been in all of my answers, but I feel like you're, this is one where someone might not, I guess, take that approach. Um, first of all, I do, I am naturally optimistic. I am naturally, like I grew up with very, my mom is super like positive thinking and my parents are all about the power of the mind and positive. And so like, I grew up in that mind, in that environment and whether that was an inborn trait that was perpetuated by my environment or, you know, what, what have you, um, like that is, that is true for me. Um, and I've gone through some really dark things and, you know, experienced, uh, you know, bouts of depression. I went through an eating disorder. I, you know, have, you know, gone, I, I'm human, you know, we're humans. It's, we have the depth of both experiences is true to us. You can't go through this human life and not experience the lows and have the shadow parts of yourself. And I'm someone who believes very strongly in, in looking at those parts of ourselves and allowing ourselves to feel the, the depths and to, to be face to face with our darkness. And so I want to just, I guess, uh, make clear on that point that Yes, I believe in, you know, approaching life with a perspective of holding open arms for all of it and, you know, allowing all of it to be present with compassion and acceptance and, you know, a, a deep level of love, love not saying like, oh, I really like this experience of struggling, but more so having an appreciation for having this human life, which means experience experiencing all of it. And I truly believe that when we are experiencing our greatest challenges and our greatest struggles, that is pointing us towards our path of healing. And that's showing us, you know, where we have work to do or where we can go to reduce suffering in the future. And through going through it head on, not trying to get around it, but through like sitting through it, being with our pain, being with our shadow parts, we step more greatly into the light and you know, are able to build that inner strength and resilience. So anyways, that's, that's my perspective on that, if that is part of what you were asking. But to go from, you know, this piece of, you know, the work that I do individually with others, this is the part where I was saying, I'm, I'm going to be fully honest, is that, yes, I absolutely agree with you that we live in a culture that does not promote that um, so much of the work that I do, and I tell my clients this all the time, like the things that you're learning here in order to make them an established part of your life and perpetuate them for yourself, you're going to be swimming upstream. Like you're going to be surrounded by people who don't understand you, who are living life differently, who are trying to impose their values on you. And that's not their fault because we live in a society that imposes those values. And we've all, you know, been for lack of a better term, brainwash you know, by being part of this society. And, and that's the reality. And like, yeah, when you think about it that way, that can be really depressing and, and hard to, to see. Um, but to me, I have so much reverence and gratitude and admiration and respect for the people who are doing the work at the grand scale level, who are, trying to change policy, who are, you know, trying to create big change in terms of the way that our society is run, you know, within politics, within government, within law and all of that. That is amazing. And I, I personally don't have the capacity for that. But I do have the capacity to sit individually with people in that pain, in that dark place, and hold my hand out and pull them through it. And that's where I feel like I can have the biggest influence is in that one-on-one -on -one space of saying, this is going to be hard and it's going to be totally possible. And I believe in you to be able to change. And I'm going to, you know, work with you through this. And I believe in the ripple effect. I believe that, you know, when I think of the number of people that I have been able to help just because I had help getting through, you know, my darkness and continue to, you know, work through this human life with the help of others. 
I believe in, in the ripple effect. And I believe that the work that we do with individuals, you know, expands outward. And, you know, we are helping people who then are showing up in the world as a different version of themselves. And even just, you know, you and I are both vegan. So I'm sure you understand the feeling of, you know, we create the most, or I, my opinion, I guess I should say, is that we create the most influence when we simply show up as a positive example. You know, I, the number of people that have, you know, adopted a plant-based diet in the decade that I've been plant-based, who I know, is at this point, you know, <laughs> tens and dozens. And that's not because I told anyone, you have to do this, you know, whatever, whatever. It's because when I went vegan, I was the only person I knew who was vegan. And I have a number of friends who knew me at that time who now are, you know, at least largely plant-based or fully vegan. And I was the first person they personally knew who was vegan. And, and that's not like a pat on the back, oh, yay me, but that's just uh, an explanation of this idea that when we show up as an example of these principles, we start creating that different, that shift in the world. And so um, the more that, you know, and that's how I view the work that I do. And that's why I feel good about it, because even though I'm working with individuals um, at that personal level, I believe that who they are in the world does make a difference to the collective. Um, and so, you know, we can work from the outside in or we can work from the inside out. And I think that there's value to both. And like I said, I am over on the sidelines rallying for all the people working from the outside in. Um, and maybe I'll be able to do that with the research that I'm doing um, long-term. But as of right now in my coaching work at the very least, I'm working from the inside out. And, and that's kind of how I view that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. And it reminds me why I do this podcast to be, mm. be, re be reminded. Because uh, I think I, I, my tendency is to lurch towards the extremes. Mm. Um, you're right. To see, to see a, uh, an antithesis to a thesis and reject the thesis. And then, you right. know, like a year and a half later, I'm like, well, they're both sort of right in different situations. <laughs> and I, I could save myself a hell of a lot of time and made many fewer enemies if I just, you know, sort of. <laughs> Kept, kept an open mind and a shut mouth. So I appreciate yeah, yeah. the reminder. Mm, um, so you, uh, you talked about this um, intersection of, of eating disorders and vegan diets as, mm -hmm. a, as a topic. And I imagine those words out of context could trigger all sorts of people in all sorts of ways. Oh, yes. <laughs> right? Like from, from um, I can't remember what, uh, I think it was actually the AND, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, had an article, this must have been seven or eight years ago, uh, looking at orthorexy and, and conflating it with veganism or plant, whole food plant-based-ism. And like, mm -hmm. I, you, know, <laughs> you know, I didn't have a firearm, so I couldn't shoot my computer. Uh, but there's some truth woven into all that as well. What, like, first of all, what got you interested in that topic? Yeah, so um, I mean, if everyone wants to go back and listen to our first conversation where they hear my personal story of having, you know, experiencing disordered eating, struggling with that when I was younger, finding a whole food plant based diet and feeling really wonderful in that, but getting backlash um, from others in, in that being, you know, saying that was an iteration of the eating disorder and things like that. Um, and then just through the work that I do with people in, their relationship with food um, and just having, you know, a history of being plant-based and being in this world for many years myself, I, you know, have had the opportunity to work with a number of people who in that process of, you know, wanting to find a healthy relationship with food where it's not full of stress and guilt and shame and overthinking and overanalyzing every decision all day long, but still wanting to be vegan or whole food plant-based or whatever iteration of that term they want to use um, that, that feels true to them. And, and feeling a struggle with that because if they have dabbled at all in the, you know, the world of traditional eating disorder recovery, you know, that was, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know what term to use, like basically just, um, so, I mean, just highly controversial and basically, you know, not allowed. Like it was truly just seen as, as truth that, you know, a vegan diet was an iteration of the eating disorder. And so that being the case, um, going into this, I, I really just wanted to look at, 
how much truth is there to that? You know, do we have research to say that, you know, obviously I don't believe that a vegan diet is inherently an eating disorder, but at the same time, is there truth to the fact that vegans experience a greater level of eating disorders, a greater um, incidence of eating disorders than people who eat a standard American diet? And um, yeah, just looking into all of that and also looking at, there are so many stories of, you know, anecdotal stories, um, nothing yet published, but hopefully my research will change that. Um, but anecdotal stories of people who ate a vegan diet at some point in their eating disorder recovery and that it was helpful to them. And so I really wanted to understand, well, what's the difference then? Why for some people um, do they approach a vegan diet and, and adopt it? Or do they, you know, in what cases is that experience negative and harmful for their relationship with food? And in what cases is it beneficial and helpful? And what creates that difference? And so that's where, you know, a lot of this came from is asking those questions and realizing that we don't have the answers that, you know, I last semester um, of my program, um, not the spring, but fall of 2020, um, I conducted a systematic review of all studies that have ever looked at uh, vegan diets and eating disorders and that relationship. And there are only 32 studies that have ever been published on that topic. There are a lot that have looked at vegetarianism, um, but not veganism. And the reason why it's important to distinguish between those two is when you look at study, so most studies on this topic have looked at vegetarianism and have included veganism as a quote, form of vegetarianism. So they are lumping together semi-vegetarians who just avoid, you know, red meat or, um, you know, still eat fish or, you know, whatever it is, um, along with full ethical vegans. And so that is, you know, a pretty wide spectrum to say semi-vegetarian, pescatarian, lacto-ovo vegetarian, vegan, like, you know, the whole spectrum as one group. Um, and recently in the past, uh, let's see, I think 2012 was the first time they did this. So past decade, um, they, they did a couple of studies where they would separate out the groups. So they would say, okay, let's, you know, yes, we're, we're looking at vegetarianism, but let's separate this out and say, okay, what was the case for, you know, semi-vegetarians? What is the case for pescatarians? What is the case for lacto-ovo vegetarians? What is the case for vegans? And in those studies, every single time, semi-vegetarians have the highest incidence of eating disorder symptomology and vegans have the lowest. And the reasoning that they, you know, conjecture at this point, we don't know, we don't have uh, anything to confirm this, but the idea that has been tossed around most is that semi-vegetarians, there's in most cases not a value level component to that. That is, oh, I heard this was healthier, so I should do this. And it's typically around this idea of, I just want to lose weight. Whereas for veganism, there's this deeper meaning of, I really care about the environment, or I really care about, you know, being part of this peaceful, compassionate system that isn't harming animals, or I really care about, you know, the, the food system at large and my health as a whole, not focused on specifically, I just want to change my body. And it's so important to have those deeper level values because that takes the focus away from the calories and the specific, like the specifics of like the, all the things that people overthink and really gets down to, this is a value system that is bigger than me. That is about something um, that has purpose and meaning beyond myself as an individual. And that is so helpful in creating that healthy relationship with food because we live in a society that's so rampant with diet culture. And so that is one of the things that we're finding that is, is really exciting. And now I'm forgetting even the initial question that you asked me because I've gone on this tangent, but um, so I'll stop there and see what your follow-up question is. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, about, it was about what got you into interested in the question. Mm, yes. That intersection in the first place. Right. Um, for, for a bunch of things come to mind for me. For, first of all, um, I think it takes a certain amount of, of courage and or foolishness to even ask the question. Mm. Because very few people want to know the answer. Right. right? 
Yeah. So <laughs> I will say that that they want. All I'm. Big... Oh yeah, yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah, just to to respond to that, I've had this in mind for years. I mean, when I first entered my PhD program, um, you know, what was it? Three years ago. 18. Yeah, over three years ago. Um, uh, yeah, or four. That was, you know, that was the ultimate goal is someday I want to study this topic. But I didn't think that it was time. I didn't think that the world was ready for it. I didn't feel like I, um, I had some imposter syndrome about like, I can't be the one to, to push that or to, you know, start looking into this because, you know, who am I to do that? And a year and a half ago, I was talking with one of my mentors, one of my professors, and just kind of offhandedly, you know, went on this tangent about eating disorders and veganism, um, because we were talking about, you know, self-compassion and how that related to food. And I had taken a neuroscience class with her. And anyways, that's a different story. But um, in our conversation, I went on this tangent about eating disorders and veganism. And then I, at the end of it, I was like, you know, but that's, that's the 10 year plan. And, and I was like, I'll do that when, you know, the world's more ready for it. And she stopped me and she was like, that is the work that you need to do. Because we were talking about, you know, what is the focus of my dissertation going to be? Am I going to take, you know, this thing or that thing that I've been writing, you know, and doing research on. And um, she, she really encouraged me to be the one to take that step and um, really gave me that sense of empowerment to say, it's okay to be the one to ask those questions. It's okay to stir up a little controversy and push the envelope in that way because the world, even if the world isn't fully ready for it, it also is because as you know, there's a growing, a rapidly growing number of people who eat a plant-based diet and eating disorders are as on the rise as they have been. Um, and there are a lot of people presenting to these clinics who want to eat a vegan diet who want to stay in their plant-based lifestyle and are being turned away because you're not allowed to eat that way in a residential program. And since, so when we first, when I first decided that that was going to be the, the focus of my research, there were zero recovery centers in the United States that allowed someone to eat a vegan diet in inpatient recovery. Hmm. Um, today, there are a few that, that have started to, um, I know one center that has five locations um, for certain they have, um, it's actually publicly stated on their website, like we accept vegan, vegan patients. Um, and there have been a few others, like a just, you know, a handful of others since that center started doing that, that have followed suit, but still the vast, vast majority, it's not allowed. And um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's something that I feel very fortunate to have a dissertation team of professors who are rallying behind me to, to ask these questions, even if they themselves aren't vegan or, you know, you know, whatever. Um, they, they have encouraged me. And I think that I just want to uh, recognize that and the importance of that, because it's something that I knew I wanted to study, but didn't think I would be doing so soon. Mm. Yeah, I want to follow that, but I, but I, like uh, I've just you know found a tangent I want to pursue. Yeah, I'm all it, about the but, tangents. Um, like, do these? And I'll, I'll ask the question, and then I'll I'll back up a little bit. Which is just like, is there any evidence that these residential programs actually work for people with eating disorder disorders? And what I want to back up and ask is like, I know you've you're you're a, we're working as a coach for people and. As a coach, I have found it's very hard to find any evidence on what works as a coach. Like, I, you know, I'm curious, like I really want to be the best coach I can be. I've written a bunch of books. I'm used to research and it's really frustrating. I don't have any idea what works in coaching. Mm -hmm. like, I, like I know what works for me, what works for my clients. And honestly, it's anecdotal. There's, there's um, reporting bias. There's, there's all kinds of bias. Like, what do you, do you know anything about what actually helps people? Yeah, this is a great question. So I'll start by saying your first question is tough because I don't want to say that recovery centers. Okay. So it's hard because 
there are multiple stages of recovery centers. There are inpatient programs where you live at the center, it's residential, it's, you know, it's a, it's a full stay. And very often in those programs, you have very little control over what you're eating and what you're doing. And it's, you know, kind of um, the most extreme cases where like your health is in, is in, you know, dire danger. Um, and then there are cases that are, or there are programs that are outpatient where you're coming in daily, um, you know, basically nine to five, as if it's your job, you're in an, in a recovery center. And then there are also, you know, I don't know what term to use lower level outpatient programs where, you know, you're coming in twice a week to do a two hour group session, or, you know, you're checking in with your, your team, your dietitian, your therapist, things like that. Um, so there are multiple stages of recovery that being said, or treatment, I should say that being said, um, when you look at, you know, the statistics of the success rate of inpatient centers, um, or, you know, treatment, you know, clinical treatment for eating disorders, 30% of treatments fail and 30 to 40%, you know, look like success at first. And then the person relapses. And so we're looking at close to 70% of people never get healthy through clinical treatment. And that is a terrible statistic. Um, but I also don't want to use that to encourage people not to get help if they need it, because it is really hard to overcome, you know, uh, mental health conditions on your own if you don't have support and guidance. So, you know, I take this, this dualistic approach where I say, be really mindful and conscientious and intentional about which program you choose and make sure that you feel aligned with the systems that are used there and, and the way that it's done. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of programs that are making progress. Um, I think that the issue is that historically, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we focus so much on the symptoms. And so a lot of symptoms or a lot of treatment programs are, you know, taking the standard medical model where it's like, okay, what are the symptoms? How can we remove them? Um, and so it'll be like, okay, let's weight restore this person or, okay, let's make sure that, you know, at every meal, they're eating all the foods that we tell them to, or let's make sure that this person is no longer binge eating. Um, and sure, you know, you can get someone to be in that place and that feels good at first. And like we said earlier, if you're not getting at these deeper level, you know, root causes, you're not going to create long-term sustainability. And so there are programs that are starting to have a more integrative model. Um, and, and that's wonderful to see, but personally, I think that it needs to be even more. So it needs to be, you know, we're addressing the symptoms as needed, you know, when someone's health is in danger because of that, but the primary focus is these underlying causes. And so that's what I would like to see. Um, in terms of research for coaching, um, I tend to turn a lot to looking at models of recovery and these are theoretical, um, but looking at theoretical models of recovery, for instance, as I was just mentioning, um, in the space of mental health, just I'll speak on that just because that tends to be, well, that is my specialty. That's where I feel like I have the most knowledge. Um, this medical model approach, as I've said, is the standard. But in recent years, um, there's been this movement towards what they call the recovery model. So this came out of um, probably, you know, a few decades ago, I think it was it started in the 90s. Um, researchers started doing qualitative studies rather than just looking at, okay, let's look at all these quantitative components. Let's look at the numbers. Let's use these measures. Um, that's another thing we can go into is the measures of eating disorders, the way that they measure them with the scales, as you mentioned, orthorexia. Um, it's really difficult and not really conducive to measuring that in someone who wants to be vegan, especially. Um, there's a, there's a lot of issues in the methodology that we use for that. But anyways, speaking to the recovery model. Um, so they started doing qualitative research where they were doing long form interviews with people who have recovered and maintained long term, like multiple decades recovery from eating disorders. And so rather than looking at the specific programs on what's happening while someone's in a treatment facility, they said, let's hear the stories of people who have gone through, gone through long-term recovery and stayed there. 
what is it that facilitates that process for them? What is it that keeps them in that state of recovery? And through doing, you know, hundreds and thousands of these interviews, what they've found is that it's not about changing the food and it's not about specifically the body. And this is where a lot of that comes from when I'm talking about it. It's about getting to these deeper level causes. So, um, you know, there's, uh, in the space of feminism and sociology, there's done a lot of like feminist research on, you know, feminist theoretic, the, the theoretics of feminism in eating disorder recovery. And for someone who feels this rage at the patriarchy and feels this political stance that they want to fight back against this system that has told them that they need to be, look, eat a certain way, that can be that deeper level, like giving purpose to recovery, giving a deeper purpose to their life and to their mission. And that's something that, you know, anecdotally we see in veganism and theoretically, you know, we'll see if that comes out in the research, but um, makes sense that it could be helpful for someone to have this connection to food that is not about the shape of their body. That is, you know, this bigger level picture of, you know, caring about the environment, caring about the food system, um, about the treatment of animals and, and looking at that side of it and really having this connection to something bigger than themselves that's meaningful and purposeful. And so anyways, what the recovery model shows is that so much of it is about having a connection to yourself, having a positive self-identity, having connection to others, having connection to a bigger whole, being part of a bigger whole. And that might just be, you know, nature, that might just be your local community, or that might be, you know, whatever religion or spirituality that you have. Um, feeling a sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment. I mean, so many people, if you're struggling with overeating or, you know, binge eating regularly, especially overeating, I think is when I see the most of this, there's this sense of feeling hungry, but you're not actually hungry for food. You're hungry for, you want to be full in your life. And very often these are people who hate their career, don't have strong relationships in their life, don't have, you know, hobbies that they enjoy and get to spend a lot of time doing. It's things, you know, it's, it's those who feel like they don't have this deep sense of fulfillment in their life other than food. And so food is their way to feel full. And we do get, you know, you can talk about the neuroscience of having the dopamine response and all that, but you know, it, it comes down to so much of this meaning and purpose and connection are these deep keys that facilitate that long-term recovery. And so that's where a lot of, you know, the focus of my work and of my coaching comes from is looking at these models. And then, um, you know, like for specific practices, um, you know, I love looking into mindfulness based practices. I'd say there's the most research on that. Um, but in terms of like specific coaching techniques for exactly what I do, I think it's so individualized. And so, um, I always see it most important to be, you know, client led and to really understand the person that I'm working with and see, okay, based on, you know, their personality, their values, their circumstances, what do I feel like is going to work best for them? And then, you know, they're the feedback loop. Is that resonating? Is that feeling supportive to them? Um, and so that's, that's how I tend to balance that out. Hmm, that's helpful. Um, so when you work with people, it's usually, it's online, I guess, you know, for the past year, it's been pretty virtual, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like basically our, our main tool, if not our only tool is language. Yes. Uh, how, what do you hear? You mentioned diet culture a few times. I'm not sure I know exactly what that means, other than it's sort of, you know, sort of a, a social political buzzword that I either yeah. you know, resonate with or not. But I'm sure there, I'm sure there's something you know there there. Um, talked about people coming in with the wrong idea of where where the focus of their work should be. How do you hear that in language? Like, how do you know? where, you know, where someone's coming from and what's getting in their way from the way they talk? Yeah, interesting question that I'm going to try to put into words because I feel like so much of that aspect of my work feels intuitive to me rather than calculated. Like I'm not looking for certain buzzwords or phrases, mm -hmm. but I'd say that, you know, if I think that it's it's also a piece of having these theoretical understandings and having the experience 
the work experience that I do, I know what questions to ask. Um, you know, if, if someone, you know, is expressing that like, you know, every night they come like, yeah, every night they come home and like the only thing they can think about after they've had lunch all day is what they packed for their snack. And then it's like, after the snack, it's like the only thing they can think about is what they have they're, they're having for dinner. And, you know, if that is like the perpetual, like that's all they can think about all day long, then my question, you know, would be if you weren't caught up in thinking about that, what would you like to be thinking about? Where do you wish that you could put your attention and your energy? And, or it might be, you know, what do you have to look forward to in your day other than food? And if the answer is nothing, that's a problem, yeah. you know, that, you know, that's a problem or, you know, so, and, you know, when I ask the question of like, what would you like to put it toward that for me is pointing me in the direction of like, this is what they, you know, truly care about and food is getting in the way of them being able to focus on that because it's this kind of cover coping mechanism. So those are some of the things that, that those are examples, I guess I'd say. Uh -huh. what, what came to me when you said that is like, oh, that's how I am on long airplane flights mm -hmm. right? where I'm in an uncomfortable seat with nothing to do. Right. So you're bored. I'm so bored. imagine being bored with life, with having like nothing that is meaningful or purposeful to you in your life. And so often, like we said earlier, pointing to like the down downtroddenness of society is this idea that, you know, if you were told if you have this high paying job, or if you do this, this, and this, then you'll be well respected as, you know, a lawyer or a physician or, you know, what, what have you, maybe it's even, you know, like, a, I don't know, any job truly, but if you do this, this, and this, it'll make you happy, but that's not what you really care about. Or, you know, you go out with your friends for drinks at the bar, but you're looking for deeper connection than that. Like that doesn't feel connected to you. So you're doing the thing that other people are doing that like is romanticized when you're watching movies or, you know, hearing about like, oh yeah, like we, you know, let's go get drinks. And that feels like this fun thing, but for you, that isn't. And so it's just looking at, you know, being able to have your own filter, I think, to the messages of the world and being able to march to your own beat and honor what is authentic to you. And so maybe you're someone who really does enjoy, you know, going out to the bar with friends or, you know, going to the movies or doing whatever it is. But maybe you're someone who, you know, wants to stay in and play board games, or maybe you're someone who wants to go out in nature with a microscope, or not a microscope, but uh, what is it called when it's a circle? <laughs> it's just a uh, magnifying, uh, glass. magnifying glass. That's it. With a magnifying glass and look at, you know, bugs, or maybe you want to go forage mushrooms or like, you know, whatever it is, like you do you do the things that like you actually care about and that bring you joy. And you don't all, you also don't have to change the world. I think there are a lot of people who are like, I need to find my purpose and do something meaningful, especially in my generation, this millennial generation of like, you know, changing the world and doing things that, you know, are, are super conscientious and conscious choices and things like that. You know, that's wonderful, but you can make conscious choices in your daily life without having your work be this change the world thing. And so there can be this sense of, shame and feeling not good enough that you know you're not doing whatever thing you don't have the high enough paying job you didn't get the advanced degree you don't you know you aren't changing the world in a meaningful way through your work it doesn't feel like to you and so then you feel bad about yourself or you feel like you don't have enough friends or you feel like you don't have a romantic partner or whatever it is and you feel bad about yourself and so you take that shame or that feeling of not enough and you use food to distract yourself or numb yourself or make yourself feel okay in that moment, but then it all comes back. So you need food to just keep mm -hmm. covering it up. Um, food basically is just one of those things that becomes a universal cover up distraction coping mechanism. Yeah. So um, I wanna let you go soon, but I wanna ask one more either or question for you to both and for me. Perfect. Um, which is, so my tendency, and I think of, I think of a spectrum of sort of like therapeutic versus coaching. And mm -hmm. I was, a, I was a, and I still am an executive business coach. So which, you know, so I come in, like my default is all about like, let's get some results. Let's do mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas the therapeutic also, you know, sort of appeals to my, let's think deep side about let's talk about everything and get to the very, very bottom of it. And, you know, like as coaches, we can, we're just curious. We're like, I just mm -hmm. want to understand this person. I did such an exciting mystery. And I find I tend towards, and here's the either or, 
you know, does, does different action lead to different thoughts or does different thoughts lead to different actions? And mm -hmm. I tended towards action, like thinking like, okay, if you're totally covering up everything with food, if you don't stop doing that by applying, you know, discipline, willpower, you know, constraints, external threats, whatever it is, if you don't stop and give yourself space, you don't even know what's underneath and what's your met, what you're missing. At the same time, um, I can see how that can get, you know, very fascistic mm -hmm. and, and external and can get the other, you know, if, especially if you're a, a good coach and you're charismatic and the other person really wants to please you, they can do the same version of, of flipping their needs inside out to, to meet your needs as the, as the coach. Like, how do you think about, you know, do you want to get people to really get in touch with their inner emptiness and their inner fullness and how they can express it? Or do you want them to start by just have one fewer donut this week for Christ's sake, you know? So it's definitely, it's, it's absolutely a both and like to me, there's no way to even either or that. Um, I will say that from a neuroscience perspective, there is more evidence to show that by like actions t show you, you know, getting into the body, the body kind of tells the brain what's happening. So very often when we feel stressed, we, f we notice it in our head that we have racing thoughts or that, you know, we are thinking this terrible thing or whatever, but our body responded first our heart rate picked up, you know, something happened. And so that's why practices like breath work and yoga and meditation can be so powerful because we're changing our body physiology first. And so there, there is research to show that, that action and like taking, taking actions or like that physiological experience of the body is, you know, prior to the level of thought in terms of the hierarchy of how that goes. That being said, it is very difficult to do one or the other. I really try to do actively working on both because, and when I say thought, so much of the work that I think is most important, at least in this space of behavior change um, and, and mental health and you know overall healing work, um, is that it's not just the surface level thoughts that we have because sure we have those thoughts, but it's important to understand why am I having those thoughts? Because thoughts are just as much of a habit as behaviors are a habit and emotions are also a habit. You know, it becomes this perpetual loop of things that is just our normal. It's like that groove, that brain wiring has become our normal and like that's where we go. And so it's really important to understand why that's happening because when you understand the why is not always necessary, but it's very helpful because if you understand the why it's easier to have compassion for it and easier to recognize that you can choose something else. So if you recognize, oh, I have this story about myself that says, you know, I never follow through on anything that anything I start, I always fail because I don't finish it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to say, oh, you know, I have that thought because you know, when I was younger, I tried this sport and people made fun of me and I hated it. So I dropped out. And then, you know, this person said to me, you never finish anything. And then that just became this perpetual thing that I have, you know, always done in my life because I'm afraid of failure. But when you really like, <laughs> you get down deep into that, it's like, oh, someone told me that, that was like, that thought wasn't mine. That was someone else's thought that I took in and I'm afraid of failure. And so that's what's really at the core of this is I'm afraid of failure. It's not that I have, you know, that part of who I am, a character trait is that I don't finish what I start. It's that I'm afraid of failure. And I would rather not start something that I might be embarrassed to not do well than try it all. So anyways, there's just it. And so when you understand that, it helps you to have compassion for that story, for that thought. And also be able to say, I know where you came from and you're not true. And I'm going to choose a different thought about this and pair that with, I'm going to try something and stick and stick to it. 
helps you to actually stick to it. And so it's it's the interplay of the two. Hmm, I love that. So it's the um, like hypothesis testing. Yeah. Right, like, am I am I this person? Right. Or Inductive and deductive reasoning working together. Awesome. Um, I'm, I want to I want to let you go, and I want to go play frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, this is this is like the the week in North Carolina where it's like spring. <laughs> Um, nice. but I'll, um, get to, from you where people can find you. I know you said you were going to take a break on certain things, but you know, where they can follow your work, um, uh, when, if they want to sign up for a program, the next time you offer it, how, how can yeah. we, uh, how can we connect people with you? Absolutely. So on Instagram, I am at Tara Kemp underscore. That's definitely where I spend the most time social media wise. Um, but I also have a website reconnectcollective.com. And there you can sign up for my email newsletter, which um, I send at least once a month. So that's another space where you can stay connected and just depends what you like. Um, I'm pretty long winded. And like you said, going deep everywhere. Uh, but uh, that's where you can find me. Awesome. That's reconnectcollective.com. Yes. I'll put links in the show notes. And wow, thank you so much. This is the there's there's a lot in here i'm just going to say that that is going to make it into my group work with clients and probably mm. on one work so i i appreciate your generosity in sharing all this and happy to learn from you and really excited to see uh, where your your research takes you awesome well thanks how yeah always so fun to connect with you and have these conversations and i love that you're going to take it back to your clients i'm always learning too so um yeah thank you again for having me all right. Be well. You too.